I want to start today's episode in a different way than what we normally do. I want to read you the introduction from, or at least part of the introduction from my new book, I Want to Trust You, But I Don't. I want to trust you, but I don't. I want to believe that you have my best interest in mind, just like I do for you. I want to believe you don't have hidden agendas, motivations that are completely self-serving, or something going on behind the scenes that I would be crushed by if I knew about it. I want to believe that the good feelings I have when you're being kind to me will still feel good a month from now, a year from now. I want to believe you've told me the whole story and that I won't make discoveries later that make me cry and feel the brutal weight of regret. I want to believe that I won't lie in bed sobbing over the red flags I missed or chose not to pay attention to. I want to believe I can count on you. I want to believe that your love is real and your care is genuine. I want to believe I'll feel wise and not stupid for trusting you. I want to believe I'm safe with you and that you really are my person. I want to believe I'll be okay if I trust you, but I'm scared. I'm afraid the risks are just too high. My heart says I love you, but my fear says it's not safe, and fear has the louder voice right now. So I want to trust you, but I don't. Joel, as you and I studied the topic of trust in vertical relationships between us and God, but also with relationships human to human, we found something from a theological standpoint that I think is really important for us to remember. Yeah. We do want trust in our human to human relationships, but we can't attach the full hope that we have of safety and our future and even stability in our relationships. We can't attach it to finding other humans who will never break our trust because the reality is all relationships carry with it a bit of risk Mm -hmm. because we're having relationships with humans. Yeah, I think that's so true. I remember as we're working on kind of the theological core um, for I want to trust you, but I don't. um, One of the things that really stuck out to me is the intentionality of the biblical text, especially in the Hebrew Bible, the you know from Genesis to, through Malachi, to use precise words for specific situations, you know. And so I know everybody knows this, but I'm just going to say, just for the sake of saying it, our Bibles were not written in English. You know, it's kind of like a funny thing, but also just important for us to recognize. I grew up with people who believed it was the King James Version. Just a program note. Yeah, thank that you. it was the original Bible. I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. The <laughs> Old Testament's written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And with that, one of the fascinating things when we're kind of researching and studying the concept of trust, we want to do a a biblical word study around this. And so basically what you do is you take the English word and then you're trying to reverse engineer and you're trying to look at all the Hebrew words that are kind of connecting to that English word. And one of the fascinating things, Lise, was the realization that the Hebrew word bata, uh, I know you're going to ask me, Joel, spell that for everybody. Well, I actually know how to spell the oh, word. Oh, wow. Because oh, we've studied it okay, so long. I want you to do it. But I'm, I'm going to have you do it just in case. Oh, man. Okay. She'll spell check you. Bata. Don't worry, you. Bata. You can say it really well, too. And yes. you cause, And you read your book, and you said the Hebrew words in the book as well. Yes, without me having to call you. And That's say, right. Can you please pronounce this before I read the audiobook? I'm so proud of you. It's amazing. Um, and so we can, take a, we can take a chance on me spelling it. I you want, want to do it. I do. I feel I'm, like I'm this super, is part of trust. I feel like this is a real life example of trust. I'm not just, rehearsed. I'm super rehearsed. nervous, and I may totally mess this up. B a t a h. Bata. Yes. <laughs> Got it. So proud of you. Um, that was but, stressful. That was so off script. But you did such a great job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so bata um, has an object. So all of the words, so the question is trust. What is the object of trust? Well, um, throughout the Hebrew Bible, when the object of trust, bata, is God, that word is always painted in a positive picture. Hmm. We're, we're being conditioned and trained to recognize every time we're thinking about trust in God, the outcome is good, it's fruitful, it's flourishing. Like, like these things are going to be positive. Interestingly, every time the object of bata is humankind or objects even, right? Things, possessions, money, anything like that, it is overwhelmingly cast in a negative way. Hmm. Wow. 
And so um, when we begin to just think through um, how does God want us to consider trust uh, and experience it, the goal is always that we put our full faith and trust in God so that, and I think this is an important part, so that when our trust in other humans is fractured or compromised or is broken, we won't be broken. Mm. Like, like we are not going to be shattered because we have something underneath it that's actually holding everything else together. Yeah, I remember writing in the book, broken trust can be life-altering, but it doesn't have to be life-ruining. Mm. Yeah. And That's I good. think the purpose of I want to trust you, but I don't is not to give people a formula so that they can be in human relationships that are perfect because there is no perfection found in mm-hmm. human to human relationships. You can improve. You can get better. You can learn how to repair broken trust. You can even learn how to set your relationship up for success so that the trust can thrive. Yeah. But there's never going to be a stability created within a human to human relationship that is perfect. Therefore, the promise of the book is that we need to learn to create an inner stability to be able to withstand the storms that will come, and they will come. Yeah. And it's it's not just that we have the tools that we need, but we have a foundation to know there is one who will never break trust with us, and that is God. Now, to say all of that, it gets a little complicated Mm -hmm. because sometimes— is it okay if I make an honest confession? Yeah, please. You good with confession time? Oh, I love confession time. Okay. We talked in the previous episode about betrayal, and the last layer of betrayal— we went through six layers of betrayal. The last layer was, how could God have seen this happening? And he didn't stop it. Mm. And so some of the deepest betrayal I've ever felt— is a misunderstanding of what God allows. Mm. And so while I say my, you know, when I direct my trust toward God, He provides a stability, it has to be a faith in God Mm -hmm. that even when I see things that don't make sense or I don't see what I think God should be doing, I have to trust that God is trustworthy. I have to trust that God is good even when I don't understand what he allows sometimes. And I wrote this question in my journal recently, and I am profoundly challenged by it now every single day. And it's this, how might my life look different Mm -hmm. if I really believed in the goodness of God? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the trustworthiness of God. Mm -hmm. And so I find that very fascinating, and I think it directly links to the amount of hope that we have in our in our life, in our relationships, and just in our life in general. Yeah. And I think, for me, one of the outcomes of having trust that was broken in very significant human-to-human relationships is that I quietly started to quit on hope. Yeah. One of the things that I think is so fascinating, Lisa, about all of that is this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 24, especially as it relates to um, like what happens when we feel like God is the one who has broken trust with us. We feel like God has let us down in this area. And what I love about the Bible is the Bible does not hide any of these emotions, any of these realities. In Luke 24, I think the people of Israel actually believe that they have been let down by God. Mm. They, they've they put all of their belief systems in the fact that Jesus was going to be the long-awaited promised Messiah who's going to liberate and redeem them from the oppression of Rome. Now, this is what uh, Luke 24 uh, in verse 21 says. It's these two men that are Literally, this is kind of amazing. They are in a state of confusion, but they're simultaneously walking with the risen Christ. Hmm. Hmm. You know, which is just an interesting thought. But in verse 21, they say this, but we were hoping. Well, what are they hoping? We were hoping that he, Jesus, was the one who was about to redeem Israel. And I think that maybe one of the things that we could do is we could replace that word for hope and say that's kind of synonymous with trust. And this is just the biblical principle here. Whatever is the subject of our hope has to have substance. Mm -hmm. If we put our hope in a subject that does not have substance, we're left with hopelessness. Mm -hmm. So we can rephrase it. What is the subject of our trust? 
If we put all of our trust in a subject that does not have substance, we'll have broken trust. Hmm. And it will impact us in a, um, in, a, in a negative way. I think the thing well, that— Well, let me say something, too, that yeah. I think is fascinating about this, is sometimes we will determine or try to make the determination whether or not God is trustworthy if we're looking— for immediate relief for our greatest concern. Yes. Sometimes yeah. I think it's like, okay, God, I will know for sure you're trustworthy if you give me immediate relief for my greatest concern right now. Mm-hmm. And the people then wanted immediate relief for their greatest concern, which was basically they wanted a human king to come in and make sure that Rome no longer could be the oppressors, no longer could make these big you know, like sweeping laws that crippled the people and that threatened not only their livelihood, but even their sense of safety. Yeah. And so they wanted immediate relief for their greatest concern. Yeah. And when that didn't happen, when Jesus didn't come as the king physically that would overthrow Rome in that moment, then they started to doubt the trustworthiness of God. One of the things I love about these conversations is it's almost like the three of us, at some points, it's like we're anticipating the very next thing mm-hmm. that we're going to. And that's so perfect because I think what I would love for us to maybe do, and maybe you can do this, you know, while you're um, just processing through this episode, is what this puts on display is that often when we say we trust in someone or we trust in something, that trust simultaneously comes with conditions. Mm. So it's a trust, but only if, and it's A, B, C, and D. Mm-hmm. Very so linear kind of, yeah. Yeah, and so then something that is lacks trust or breaks trust is actually it's because of our issues. It's because of our conditions that we've placed. And, and, and theologically, biblically, what I'm just trying to try to point us to is that the conditions aren't necessarily bad in the human-to-human relationships. We're going to talk about that. sometimes necessary. They're actually sometimes, most often incredibly necessary, yes. right? However, and when it comes to God, when it comes to the perfect, matchless King of heaven and earth, we have to be very careful that we don't put our human conditions on the infinite and only bata, trustworthy one who is God. And sometimes I think if we're feeling like God's let us down, God has betrayed us, God is right, it might be a good inventory to say, oh, in all honesty, in my human flesh, I have conditioned my trust with God based off of A, B, C, and D. And almost write those things down, you know? And then lay it in front of the Lord. Maybe call a close friend of yours who you all like pray together and, and just say, hey, these are some things I'm honestly struggling with. Like, I don't wanna have these as the conditions that I'm gonna trust in God because God is gonna surpass like all of my needs in the way that I need them, not necessarily in the way that I yeah. want them. And so uh, again, human to human relationships are different. We wanna be careful that we don't conflate a human to human versus a human to God relationship. But in the same way, we have to also be careful. We don't put conditions on God that is actually going to derail our faith and um, mess with the way that we see how life is actually unfolding uh, for us. I am very careful to always acknowledge that there's a big difference between wise trust and blind trust. Yeah, that's good. With God, Putting our trust in God is always wise trust. It's never blind trust. Even if we can't see, we can know exactly who God is, and we can trust that He has His every thought pointed toward ultimate good. Mm -hmm. And God is not freaked out by the ups and downs of life. God is God is not panicked that a human could possibly override (laughs) his goodwill. No human is more powerful than God. And so when it comes to God, even though sometimes we say we have to have faith, that doesn't equate to blind trust because trust placed in God is always wise trust. Now, with humans, we have to be very careful. We always want to have wise trust, but not blind trust. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, I would love for you to make a comment because I know you counsel so many people who have been in situations that they now have trust issues because of what they've walked through. And also, when I say trust issues, I'm not saying like, ugh, you have trust issues, like it's a bad smell or a bad disease, Mm -hmm. right? I'm saying, of course we have trust issues. If 
what you said is true, and it is, that the whenever in the Bible the object of trust is another human or possessions or status, then disappointment is always right in that mix. Yeah. So I just think, of course we have trust issues. I mean, I read some statistics, we've talked about them before, that the average American lies four times a day. We did podcast on that. That's right. I thought and it was a lot more than that for Joel. <laughs> No, we tested each other. Remember right my, here? My this feelings are hurt. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would like to repair that with you right now. Yeah. <laughs> There's a rip we need to repair. Absolutely. We came up with a lot, though. Didn't really? I remember the podcast. Yes. We were like, yeah. holy cow, we were. And so that's a lot <clears throat> of deception that we're yeah, having totally. to wade through every day. And it's not that that it's always like big betrayals. Yeah. It's like if I say I'm going to do something and then— I forget or I don't get around to it. You know, that's also a form of broken trust mm -hmm. because you didn't do what you said you were going to do and I was counting on you to do it. And so that can create that disappointment. If that's a repeated pattern over time, that disappointment does grow into a form of trust issues. And of course, it can also be like infidelity, which we've talked about a lot on the show. That's what I walked through. And experiencing that can make you not yeah. only skeptical of the person that you had that major breach of trust with, but it can make you skeptical of all people. And so I know when people come into your office, you are dealing with trust issues. Mm -hmm. So comment about wise trust versus blind trust. Well, and, and some of the things you were just alluding to, I, I talk often about a person's motive may not be to really break trust. Like I forgot to follow through. But their modus operandi, the method of operating, still is a breach of trust. If back here, uh, on one level, there has been a massive breach of trust, including in childhood, or before you were in relationship with that person, there's this post-traumatic stress reality that someone says, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you like financial infidelity, not a big one even, but a small one. I forgot to tell you that I spent money on this, or I said I would do this and I didn't follow through. Betrayal is betrayal. Now, we wanna basically right-size it, but a person could think, like Shakespeare, methinks thou dost protest too much. And often it is, no, you had major breach of trust back here, so sometimes the minor can can post-traumatic stress-wise mm -hmm. take me right back to where it is. And the person says, I, did, I just did this. You're not knowing that person's story. Now, in the idea of— So in other words, minor can feel very major— To the person, him or herself. If it validates a narrative that we've been carrying of— maybe unhealed trauma from our past mm -hmm. or unresolved issues that we have a narrative going like, don't count on people because if you count on people, you're going to be disappointed. And so if this person's actions that may yep. seem small, if they validate that narrative, it adds to a much greater picture and makes the betrayal seem even more significant. And seems and feels the person who might have betrayed in maybe a minor way, I don't know, can say, wow, you aren't you kind of overreacting? I don't even believe, just so you know, I don't believe in the word overreacting. Mm -hmm. It is I am, re what is overreact? I'm, I'm reacting. Of course, we want to learn to respond and not react. Nonetheless, when trust is broken at some level, inside, we've said often, I don't want to say this too much, but if it's hysterical, it's historical. So inside, you know, people, most people that come into my office, most people I encounter anywhere have not done their story work. I don't need to go dig in into stats for that. Mm. I can tell you my experience. They've never taken from birth till yesterday and sat with a good friend or I would argue a positive, a therapist and to sit down and say, I want to explore the facts and the impact of my story. So most couples are coming together. The more intimate the relationship, the tighter the rules need to be. The more severe and strict the rules need to be, like in a marriage. If it's not, it's what I call a mirage. It's not a marriage. So with that is I come in, and if someone has betrayed me at some level with what's going on, I sit with couples all the time, and I'll say, well, how do you think that impacted her with what you did or him? And then maybe if, do you know each other's stories, and they don't, so that if they get to know each other's stories, I say, do you see that that might have hit a seven-year-old wound in her mm -hmm. from her daddy? Naming, not blaming, right? And people don't even know. They're bumping into stuff and not even know what they're bumping into. So I want, as you've heard me say, people to be curious, not furious. And to say, okay, I'm not sure what happened here. Yeah, I didn't follow through. Tell me more. What, what's this kind of this autopsy word we've used? Mm -hmm. Everybody listening or watching today can do that and say, okay, t t let me, let me, I don't want to respond or react here. Tell me more about why this feels so big to you. I really am here to listen. 
Okay, so confession time. I always like confession sure. time. Sure, I like it too. Um, you and I did an exercise in your office. It was called the Trauma Egg, where I went through my story. And mm-hmm. I basically took a big piece of poster board, drew an egg shape, which is yep. what you told me to do, mm-hmm. divided it up into little compartments. And then any time I felt rejected as a child or maybe sexually abused or um, abandoned or mm-hmm. what I don't know what the other qualifications were. I can't any remember. Any of those. Traumatized in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it was little or whether it was big, I was to draw a little stick figurine. Uh, a little picture of it. Like a little picture of that pain that was caused in my childhood. And you know that as an author, they teach show, don't tell. So we use that in therapy to say, anything you can tell me, why don't you show me? Mm-hmm. Like, draw a picture of it. That activates a different part of the brain and the soul, even the body getting engaged. You go, yeah, I'm standing at the casket or the moving truck or the abuse scene. We don't re-traumatize people, but drawing those pictures, it's called emotional literacy. Mm. We're like, oh, I, yeah, I feel things by drawing the picture. And so then I took all those little pictures that I had drawn on mm-hmm. this poster board and I stood in front of you, and you just said, just tell me about these pictures. Like, what happened here? What happened here? And I went in order, and I went through. And I remember thinking, like, mainly you were just wanting to know more about my past, but actually you were listening for something. You were listening for a thread of commonality that wove throughout those stories from my past that would be feeding a narrative that now is a very, very sensitive spot, and I call it my shame script. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what I discovered is throughout the story, I kept reiterating this shame script that I filter so much through. So mm-hmm. when other people behave in a certain way, I filter it through this shame script. And my shame script is don't inconvenience other people. You you are kind of a pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. Like, don't ask other people to do things for you. It's just better if you do it yourself mm-hmm. because you don't want to seem like you're asking too much of other people. And if we get into that old Enneagram 9 thing, that we've talked about with you, and Enneagram 9s, whether people like the Enneagram or not, they fall asleep off into their own needs, they merge with another person, and underneath it, which you said, really, Jim? There's often anger underneath that. So inside inside me, I'm literally losing my identity, and yet you've said, well, that you're a rule follower. Mm -hmm. Like when you did that exercise, you push back first. I'll never forget, really, you want me to do this? And that's been a trait with you that I love, that you'll push back, which I love, because I trust you more when you do it. You're like, eh, and then you do it, A++. I mean, you did it marvelously. But inside there was a sense of almost like, make no waves, don't don't disturb anything, keep everything like that. And then if crisis hits you, when you have behaved well, you are the most integrous person I know, really. I've seen you through your whole journey that I've known you. And then somebody or some people or situations are not in integrity, That's that'll shake someone's entire system. Because mm-hmm. your operating system is, I follow the rules in a good way, and I have integrity. That's where a lot of people think tuning in can sit there and say, that's one of the hardest things for me because now I was never going to be unfaithful. And they're not being arrogant, like your book on humility. They're not being fake. They're saying, I really do. I keep my end of the bargain in this intimate relationship off in a marriage. And that one, especially when something happens here, where there's a break, a breach in confidentiality, a breach in trust at any level, it literally is a 9-11 for this person mm-hmm. because it's like their operating system, that's like a Mac versus a PC and you're right. trying, it just doesn't compute. So let me tell you how this plays out for mm-hmm. me. Um, so let's say I actually get up the courage in a relationship to ask somebody to do something for me. This takes a lot and I don't want to inconvenience them. Mm-hmm. And they assure me, no, I care about you. I want to do this, but then they don't do it. Mm-hmm. And so then I follow up, like, hey, did you remember to blah, blah, blah? And they go, oh, yeah, 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 I'll get to that. I promise, I promise. So what's happening in my brain is, if they do this, this will show me that their care for me is real. And if they don't do this, then I'm going to start having trust issues. Okay, why is that not true for a moment? What do you mean? Being a person who betrayed his wife in pornography, that's in my story, um, years ago, 20 years sober from that now, but there's a sense that why if a person, uh, I could go really far afield by talking about ADHD, which I also have, and sometimes in the moment because of dopamine, I'm like, I promise I'm really going to follow through with this. Many of us have done that. 
uh, in relationships. So I'm not really trying to lie. I don't follow through. Paper remembers what the mind forgets. I don't set an alarm on the phone. Now, I will know what time the ball game's on tonight, right? <laughs> and you will not forget that. Or, or some other binge watching episode thing I'm doing. There are things that are important to me because those things, you got to listen, it fires dopamine in the brain. That's that chemical that's like, yes, hyper focus. So if I don't do that inside along the way, I may not, and again, that no excuses, may not mean to betray you. And I say, sir or ma'am, did this person, your spouse, feel betrayed nonetheless? And I want to see, does it stop us? Romans even implies our sin should shut our mouths. Stop and say, tell me more. Versus when words are many, sin is not far away. That's Bible. And to say, you know what? I just got to be honest with you. I did not follow through. But it gave you that, you were saying that dopamine hit when you're like, yes, I'm here for you. And I'm not I'm lying. Fine. I mean it in the moment. I really yes. plan, but dopamine's only going to, you can't live on dopamine highs. Right. And then what happens to me inside is the next time I go to ask you to do something. Uh-oh, what do you do? It feels risky to me. It will be risky. And then I start to think, I don't know if I can count on you or not. Mm. And then if you don't follow through on that one, then quickly it becomes... I really can't count on you. And then it turns into, I don't think I can trust you. Can I autopsy that real quick? I'm not trying to play therapist here, although I can a little bit. The first one you gave out was, this is important, um, I don't know if I can trust you. Everything in communication is a statement or a question. You can find no middle ground. If you do, show me. It's either a statement or question. So when you did that first one about 35 seconds ago and you said, I don't know if I can trust you, if you autopsy that, would it be true that you leaned a tipping point more toward, I actually don't think I can trust you because of what you did last time, or are you still kind of vague there? Well, I think I always try to remind myself there's a big difference between a mistake and a pattern. Good. And so a mistake is something we all make, and we should give grace for mistakes. Mm -hmm. The problem is when that mistake starts to get repeated, then it starts to become a pattern. Yep. And if I'm sensing that this is going to be a pattern in my life, then the breach of trust happens. And then trust issues come in. It was like, oh, no, like this is the start of something big. Like it was something small, but it is turning into something big because I want to know I can count on my person. Mm. I want to know that if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. I want to know that if you say a statement, that it's true. I can count on it. I can count on you. Your operating system, all kidding aside, we know this sitting with her, is that. I would set my clock by you. Hmm. If you say you're going to do something, I could not conjure up a category that you wouldn't follow through. Could you? You've spent hours with her. Do you find if Lisa says, hey, I'm going to come through that, do you feel like, yeah, I bet she won't? Nope. Yeah. So <laughs> what I'm saying is that I'm like, that's I, a lot of pressure, I, guys. No, no, I really, I was your, really like your operating about system like, is that. I think it's for a lot of people in the practical. And then when someone's on a different, it's like without you even knowing it, like, well, I I follow through. Okay. Well, then here's my secondary shame script. I would never do that to you. Mm. That's my secondary. It's like is I that can't, true though? Is it largely true that you would never do that? In my brain, I think it is. Now, and I'm just as prone to making too. mistakes well, sure. as anybody else, mm -hmm. but I, I, I try really hard not to let mistakes mm -hmm. become patterns, and so that's when I can get into trouble. So, to break down the, the just to land the plane here on trust issues, for me, and I think for most people, trust is made up of safety mm -hmm. and connection. No doubt. I want safety in a relationship, which means I know you are who you say you are. You're going to do who you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to tell me the truth. You're going to be honest. Yeah. That, in other words, the, you're not a risky person. This mm -hmm. isn't a risky relationship. I'm not on the verge of getting hurt all the time. Mm -hmm. I also want connection. That's like the fun part of a relationship. Like you know. I love you, you love me, it's good feelings, we have a good time together, all of that. Now, what can happen when we get our trust broken is we tend to take one of those to an extreme. Hmm. So either we're so desperate to keep the relationship that we minimize our own need for safety and we ignore the red flags, mm -hmm. we know what's going on, and we just kind of go, well, 
I'd rather dance with the devil I know than dance with the devil I know. There's rationalization. And notice the seesaw with her hands, too. Mm -hmm. It's just such a bipolar thing. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I want this relationship, and I will minimize my own need for safety. Mm -hmm. That's one extreme. Mm -hmm. The other extreme is, oh, I am going to prioritize safety so much that I do not want to take any risk. And so I diminish the connection in that relationship down to just the very, very bare minimum Mm. because the more connection, the more risk, and I want safety. The goal when we Mm. identified that we are struggling with trust issues, and I want to say most of us rightfully so, Mm -hmm. the goal is to bring those two things back into equilibrium. Mm -hmm. We want safe connections. That's what we really want. And as I pulled some of my friends on social media and I was asking them, um, what makes trust feel risky to you? These are some of their answers. The possibility of getting hurt again, Mm -hmm. wondering if the other person could potentially not be who I think they are, and fearing future betrayals, rejections, or disappointments by this person. I call that last one pre-traumatic stress. We all know post-traumatic stress. But pre-traumatic stress is, I just bet something bad's going to happen. It's kind of that catastrophic Mm -hmm. thinking that can happen. And so I want to say, obviously, we all have a form of trust issues. Mm -hmm. And it's not something to just label ourselves with, but it is something to be aware of. We have trust issues. Usually there are reasons we have trust issues. And so getting into another relationship is not automatically going to fix that. Mm Many have tried. Um, Many have tried. Looking for an external solution to their internal problem. And even working on repairing trust within a relationship is not automatically going to fix the issues. Mm -hmm. I think there's a deeper thing that we have to examine. And for me, like we've talked about, examining those shame scripts and being aware, it's not just what happens to me. It's the narrative that forms because of what happens to me. And so addressing the internal narrative for me was the first big step on working on the trust issues. And the good news about that is it didn't require anybody else to do anything. And it gave me a sense of control. I can do something about these trust issues without requiring anybody else to do anything. Now, we are gonna talk about in the next episode, what do we need to repair trust in a relationship? But this this first episode right here that we're talking about trust issues is absolutely crucial that we understand that internal dialogue is going to really determine whether or not we can move forward from here.